Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, day three of Jose Uribe, the co-defendant turned star witness on the stand in the Menendez trial, the defense pulling out every punch to discredit him. As Congressman Rob Menendez is pushing back against President Biden, speaking out against private prison contracts for migrants here in the state. We just want the federal government to be consistent, one, with New Jersey state law, two, with their own directive to the Department of Justice uh, requiring the DOJ not enter into any contracts with privately run detention centers. Plus, a new study on policing practices in South Jersey finds that more transparency and communication leads to better police community relations. By making footage available to them, we have, we have seen enhanced perceptions of body camps. Now, the people who received our protocol thinks that uh, uh, the police is more professional uh, because they're using body cams. And pain at the pump. Representative Frank Pallone takes on price gouging, claiming oil and gas executives are cashing out. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Hello and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Joanna Gagas in for Brianna Venozzi. While the jury in the federal gun trial against Hunter Biden took less than a day to find him guilty on all three counts, lying on a federal screening about his drug use, lying to a gun dealer and possessing a gun. The decision came after several days of emotional testimony about Hunter Biden's struggle with drug addiction from his ex-wife and sister-in-law. First Lady Jill Biden was present most days in the courtroom, although the jury was told to disregard her. The president's son now waits for sentencing, which could be up to 25 years in prison. And in federal court in New York today, we saw day three of the prosecution's star witness, Jose Uribe, on the stand in U.S. Senator Bob Menendez's trial. He was a co-defendant who flipped and became a witness and has been the linchpin for the prosecution, detailing the bribes he says he made to Senator Menendez Menendez and his wife Nadine. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan is on the scene where she's witnessed co-defendant Will Hanna's attorneys attempt to shred Uribe's credibility. Brenda, you say the defense attorneys came out swinging. What did you see? Actually, Joanna, the defense opened fire with both barrels today, trying to, as you pointed out, shred the credibility of the prosecution's star witness. Now, that's Jose Uribe. And the reason he is so critical to this prosecution is that he's the one that can make the quid pro quo work. He is the only witness who says that he actually participated in this bribery scheme with Senator Menendez and his then girlfriend, Nadine. Now, Uribe is a real Originally charged in this case, remember, but he decided to flip. And the, the uh, defense today alleged that he flipped because the governor warned him that he was facing a completely different federal investigation on tax evasion charges. Now, Uribe uh, admitted that he did dodge uh, taxes for years. He set up family members as heads of companies that he owned, and that's how he didn't pay taxes between. I think 2011, uh, or 2016 rather, and, and 2022. And his main reason for cooperating with the prosecution, according to the defense, is to save his own skin. Yes, to shield his family, but Uribe is looking at 95 years if he's convicted on all charges here. And they say, quote, you're doing this in hopes of a sentence with no incarceration, Joanna. Okay, so Brenda, that's what we heard from Hanna's attorneys, but we know that Senator Menendez's defense attorneys also had a chance to take a shot at Uribe today. Was their approach different? What did you hear? 
Joanna, Adam Fee for the defense for Menendez hammered Uribe on lying. I mean, over and over and over again. Let me give you some quotes here. You told lies to get money. Yes, I did. You lied to a bank to get a loan. Yes, I did. You've lied to customers of your insurance company. Yes, I did. You've committed fraud and other crimes for 13 years. Yes, Uribe could do nothing but agree yes. And Fee also pushed Uribe to admit that Nadine never really told him that she personally asked Menendez to buy her a car, to get her a job, or for help in uh, taking care of her mortgage, which at some, one point was in foreclosure, Joanna. Okay, so we know that the uh, testimony of a flipped witness can sometimes work. We just saw this happen with uh, Michael Cohen in the Trump trial. We also know that cleanup is important for prosecutors, right? They're going to have a chance for redirect tomorrow. What do you expect from them tomorrow to kind of straighten out what happened today with defense attorneys? Well, you know, Menendez has always said that uh, he pleaded not guilty, and he said that the truth would, would come out in cross-examination today. Now, uh, witnesses, as you pointed out, who flip do tend to not have squeaky clean backgrounds. And so, of course, if, as you referred, Michael Cohen in the Trump hush money uh, case, the jury had to be convinced to believe him. So what the prosecution we're expecting is going to do tomorrow is try and clean up some of the damage that the defense inflicted on him today, Joanna. Uh, do you have a sense at all of, of the jury in this process and how they're receiving this information? There are some times that they seem riveted. There are other times a few of them look like they're falling asleep, Joanna, to be very honest. We know that uh, there's a long and tedious lot of information uh, being dragged out through this trial, but great information. Brenda Flanagan, senior correspondent on the scene. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you. All eight of New Jersey's Democratic House members are calling on the Department of Justice to back off of its support of private immigration detention centers in the state, saying that support defies President Biden's own position against the use of private prisons. Now, this issue landed in the courts last year after the state of New Jersey passed a law banning private facilities from entering into federal contracts to detain migrants. But a federal judge ruled to allow the Elizabeth Detention Center to remain open. It is the last remaining detention center in New Jersey, and it's run by CoreCivic. But lawmakers like Congressman Rob Menendez are concerned that the ruling leaves the door open for more detention facilities to open in the state. While that lawsuit is on appeal, he joins me now. Congressman, thanks for so much for joining us here in the studio. So you recently joined with all seven of your Democratic colleagues. You sent a letter to the Biden administration really asking for an about face on their position on ICE contracts here in New Jersey, right? Talk to us about that letter. What exactly are you asking for from them? Sure, so appreciate you having me on. And one is we've been consistent on this issue. The delegation has, myself and Bonnie Watson Coleman have led multiple letters to the administration. The state has been consistent on this issue. In 2021, um, the state legislature introduced it uh, uh, and, and the governor signed into law uh, a bill that would prohibit um, these privately run detention centers. And we just want the federal government to be consistent, one, with New Jersey state law, two, with their own directive to the Department of Justice uh, requiring the DOJ not enter into any contracts with privately run detention centers. Because this is DHS and ICE, there's a separate treatment. To us, it lacks a consistency, both with what the state has set forth as its priorities, what the administration has said with respect to the DOJ, and to be consistent. So what we've asked is that they not involve themselves in the new piece of litigation between uh, this new entity that's looking to open a new facility or reopen a facility in Newark, um, and asking them again to be aligned with our New Jersey values. So that new entity is the GEO group. They mm -hmm. are a Florida-based Florida group. They're looking right now at Delaney Hall in Newark. As you mentioned, the Biden administration sent a letter of support in the case against Course civic. Now, a federal judge ruled that New Jersey's law was unconstitutional, that it limits the, the federal government's ability to do its job. Do you believe that this case wins on appeal, which is where it is right now? Well, that's what we're hopeful for. Um, and we believe that that decision was misguided for a number of reasons. But the other part of this is also these are executive decisions. These are the administration making these decisions through DHS, through ICE, and we believe they are the wrong decisions. So because there's ongoing court cases, 
we are concerned about their involvement in those court cases. It doesn't even have to come to that. They could make a decision through DHS, through ICE, not to extend the contract in Elizabeth uh, with Core Civic, um, and then also not engage uh, this GEO group with respect to Delaney Hall. So we're going to combat this on all fronts. Um, it doesn't matter what sort of setbacks we face based on court decisions. We're going to keep hammering this issue because it's the wrong thing for New Jersey. It's the wrong thing for our constituents. It's hard to take the politics out of this moment, right? Just two days before you sent the letter, your second letter, because one was sent also yeah. in August of last year, just two days before this letter, the Biden administration came out, Biden came out and announced that he was blocking all asylum seekers who didn't come through lawful processes. He's clearly playing to the middle in the middle of a, an intense election season. How does that fare, do you believe, for this request that you've made here for New Jersey? Well, I I don't believe that's the right decision either. Um, and I believe the administration be, should look at all the tools it has available to support our immigrant communities, both here in New Jersey and throughout the country. Um, we see the value every single day that people that are here, whether on a documented or an undocumented basis, make to our communities and make to our economy. That's the message we should be driving, one that is more inclusive, one that recognizes the work and contributions of all these different individuals instead of playing to the Republican narrative. It's been a frustration that I've had with the administration because they've done some things right, trying to expand pathways through TPS and the parole program, but they've also done things that are clearly a direct response to the Republican narrative around the border, around immigration to our country, that's not the right thing to do. And we're going to keep calling them out until they do what we believe is the right thing and what's ultimately aligned with our democratic principles. Just a few seconds left. Have you heard anything back from the administration since you sent this letter? We have not yet, uh, but we're going to continue to follow up. And this is something that when we got involved with the Elizabeth Detention Center, we said wasn't a one-off letter, that we're going to continuously be involved. Myself, Congressman Kim, we're actually at the Elizabeth Detention Center with a group of uh, immigrant, immigrant rights advocacy groups uh, to make clear that this is our position and we will continue to, to work steadily on this issue until we get to a much better result. All right, Congressman Rob Menendez, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Good to talk to you. Always. Policing has come into focus in Atlantic City, specifically at Stockton University. The school received a $700,000 grant from the U.S. Department of Justice to study how specific policing practices impact the community and their attitudes around law enforcement. Things like releasing body camera footage or using a procedural justice script during stops. Well, that study produced some interesting results. I'm joined right now by the lead researcher, Nusret Sahin, who's an assistant professor of criminal justice at Stockton University. <music> professor Sahin, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I want to get a sense from you. Before we talk about the impact that these police practices had on the community, I want to talk about how you conducted this study. Can you just give us a sense of what that process was like? Yes, uh, th uh, first, thanks for having me. Uh, we, con we we partnered with Atlantic City and Pleasantville Police Departments, and uh, we did ride-alongs with police officers. And we trained officers on procedural justice and our protocol, and uh, they delivered uh, our protocol during uh, speeding stops. And uh, we um, uh, asked people who were stopped by the police uh, whether they would be willing to uh, take, a, take a survey, a short survey. And uh, uh, then after that, we analyzed uh, our data. That's how we uh, conducted this study. What is a procedural justice script? What does that sound like? Yeah, procedural justice script is a script developed by uh, uh, researchers, scholars, to enhance citizens' perceptions of the police during traffic stops. So it uh, includes elements of uh, dignity and respect, and also citizens are given a voice and they, uh, they are given explanations for why the officers uh, stopped them. So what did you find? What did you find in terms of the impact that these practices had on the community, on residents, even as they were being stopped? Yes. Uh, first, we found that, uh, like, um, um, people who are working in, the, in, the, in this field uh, knows that the impact of the body cams are fading out. Uh, citizens... Uh, uh, are not no longer believe that they have an impact on uh, police citizen interactions or they're making police professional. But by making footage available to them, we have, uh, we, we have seen enhanced perceptions of body cams. Now, the people who received our protocol thinks that um, uh, the police is more professional 
uh, because they're using body cams. In addition to that, we have a higher level of trust to the police in our uh, uh, in the group that received our protocol, as well as they are more likely or, or they are willing to cooperate with the police on uh, solving crime and also, you know, uh, we have a higher uh, level of cooperation uh, uh, in our uh, experimental group. So, what does this tell you about moving forward? Is this something that can be scaled across the state, across the nation? Can it have a major impact? Yes, uh, this may have a major impact uh, because. Uh, Currently, uh, the p police training uh, includes uh, directives on, you know, during traffic stops, officers shouldn't be engaging with citizens. And our protocol is saying that if you engage with citizens and if you give them explanations of uh, the reasons for the stops, and actually the police is doing this uh, to keep the roadway safe, as well as, you know, just making sure that the drivers are safe and also passengers are safe, if they communicate that message, uh, they are uh, more satisfied and uh, this increases their level of trust as well as uh, ob uh, obligation and uh, compliance because, you know, we also expect that this may de-escalate situations. So we are hoping that, you know, this becomes a nationwide uh, practice. Excellent, excellent study, excellent research. Thank you so much for coming on to share it with us. Professor uh, Nusret Sahin, we appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Thank you. We're facing 90 degree temperatures by the end of the week, kicking off what's been predicted to be a sizzling hot summer. And that has workers' rights groups worried. They're pushing for the legislature to move forward a bill that would put certain requirements in place for workers who face extreme heat at their jobs. But as Ted Goldberg reports, it's not without opposition from business industry advocates and the New Jersey Farm Bureau. I experienced that extreme heat where I couldn't hold it in the morning. I fainted while working. Adriana Alvarez has worked in warehouses and factories for the last few decades. She says it's not uncommon for workers to lose consciousness while working in the summer heat. I saw a lot of our, my, uh, my colleagues also fainted and feeling exhausted after working so much um, in that extreme heat, um, especially in that company that I fainted where um, they didn't provide any fan or any AC. As climate change leads to hotter summers, workers' rights groups like Make the Road New Jersey are worried about people who work outside. Make the Road helped to write a bill that would give certain protections to workers when the weather gets really hot. Things like to have a central AC, in those warehouses and also for the employers to provide fans to uh, the employers, employees, because we are a lot of people in the assembly line and sometimes one fan is not enough for everyone. I'm frustrated that another summer, an intense summer of heat, will go through without proper worker protections. Senator Joseph Cryan sponsored the bill which would require companies to do things like stop non-essential work during heat waves, provide easy access to water, and provide paid rest time in shade or cool down areas. It is stalled in the state house after facing opposition from big business and some agricultural groups. This bill is um, really a one size fits all approach to something that can't be a one size fits all approach. In late May, the New Jersey Farm Bureau sent Senator Cryan a letter criticizing his bill saying, quote, using a heat index of 80 degrees Fahrenheit is unduly burdensome and unnecessary, as the effects of heat stress are not seen until a much higher degree, and even then, it is manageable with the proper precautions. They also argue the bill would take a one-size-fits-all approach to all industries across the state when creating a heat-related illness and injury protection program. It would be an impractical and virtually unimplementable program for agriculture. What you'll hear is that the sky is falling and that uh, this will create a burden that the New Jersey economy just can't bear. Um, that's not true. Uh, this is necessary, common sense, and needed for workers. It's a coalition that includes things like school boards, um, everything from school boards to, to the Farm Bureau, uh, to some of the business groups that I think would rather go back to feudalism than actually protect some of their workers. Critics have also said the bill is vague. Senator Cryan has thoughts about that. Vague is a Trenton term for we don't want it and this is how we're going to attack it. The bill defines, um, requires employers to have 
water available for employees within the immediate vicinity of an employee working, but it doesn't define what immediate vicinity is. The New Jersey Business and Industry Association says they've discussed the bill with Cryon and say companies already take steps to protect their workers. It's really hard to find um, workers willing to work in certain environments and just work, workers willing to work um, in any environment in, in this state. So our employers are treating employees better than they ever have been. Despite those efforts, nearly 500 American workers have died from heat-related illnesses on the job nationwide between 2011 and 2022. That's according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. OSHA is expected to introduce heat-related rules in September after years of prep work, but it might be a while before they're put into practice. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. That price you're paying at the pump, it might be a result of price gouging. That's an allegation that New Jersey Congressman Frank Pallone is exploring. He sent a letter late last month to seven of the major oil and gas companies asking them to reveal documents that could prove they're colluding to profit at a time when inflation's causing financial pain for all of us. Raven Santana spoke to Pallone at the John Bon Jovi gas station where drivers are already feeling the pain. The allegations uh, that prompted this investigation by my Energy and Commerce Committee, where I'm the ranking member, uh, came initially from the Federal Trade Commission. Congressman Frank Pallone, who is ranking member of the U.S. House Energy Commerce Committee, wants to hold big oil companies accountable. He's accusing the CEOs of ExxonMobil, Chevron, BP America, Hess, Shell USA, Devon Energy, and Occidental Petroleum of colluding to drive up gas prices. You know, we are moving towards or away from fossil fuels, towards renewables, electric vehicles, and all that. But I think that that's the very reason this is happening. In other words, you know, the oil companies realize more and more that they're a thing of the past. And so they're, it's like a last ditch effort to try to, you know, make more money before they can't. And so I think that's part of it, unfortunately. Pallone, who is pushing for a congressional investigation into the oil companies, shared details of the damning Federal Trade Commission's complaint about former oil executive Scott Shetfield. The announcement was made in front of the John Bon Jovi rest stop, where he says price gouging at the pump could occur as families head to and from summer road trips. The Federal Trade Commission, uh, which is the federal agency that deals with antitrust violations, and they specifically mentioned the conduct of former Pioneer Natural Resources CEO Scott Sheffield. And the FTC has alleged that Mr. Sheffield colluded with OPEC, again the cartel, the foreign cartel if you will, um, uh, and with its membership to artificially increase crude oil prices and gouge Americans at the gas pump. It finds its way into the package delivery, goods and services in our stores, in addition to the prices we're paying to get to and from work, get our families to where they need to be. Pallone was joined by the executive director of the League of Conservation Voters of New Jersey, Ed Potasnik. When there's smoke, there's probably fire. Uh, there's, you know, if you don't have anything to hide, why don't you just produce the documents? Potasnik says the goal now is to get the big oil companies in question to release their financial documents. Truth is today what we're looking at is oil company CEOs are, are raking in record profits. Um, last year alone, the oil and gas companies earned $174 billion in profits, all while gas prices were continuing to rise. And it's good that they're coming down a little bit, but it still means like we're not opposed to folks making money. It's the fact that they're using the inflationary pressures, or in the case that the congressman said, that they're colluding to raise prices, that leaves us having to shell out more so they can just pay out more to their executives and board members. Pallone says Democrats are now trying to convince the Republicans to have a hearing so they can subpoena the oil companies for the documents. We reached out to the companies Pallone named and none responded. But the American Petroleum Institute said American oil producers have answered the call to meet growing energy demand. For NG Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. Turning to Wall Street, stocks dropped today as the Fed policy meeting kicked off. Officials discussing the future of interest rates. Here's a look at how the markets closed. Support for the Business Report is provided by Experience the Vibrancy of Newark's Arts and Education District and Halsey Street. Halsey, a neighborhood built on heart and hustle.
Visit HalseyN-W-K.com for the 2024 Halsey Fest schedule. That does it for us tonight, but before you go, don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Joanna Gagas for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSCG Foundation. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSCG Foundation is committed to sustainability, equity, and economic empowerment. Investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.